Three Majors here with Majors Academy Dog Training out of Green Bay, Wisconsin, and we are back live on our weekly show. We're back on the road. Episode 104. We're here. What we do is take your questions, we answer them, and uh, we help out a bunch of people. So if you are watching live, we're live every Wednesday. It may change, and I'll let you know. But for now, every Wednesday at 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock. And we are going to encourage everyone out there to ask questions so that um, <clears throat> many people may hear your questions or, your, or my answers to your questions because it can help out a lot of people that are struggling with the same thing. All right, let it go. So, with that being said, you guys who are watching live have the priority. Ask questions. Get them answered by a dog training professional, a dog behavior professional. I'll give you a, a, a little introduction to myself real quick, just for new people who are maybe tuning in. Um, I've uh, been doing this now for since 2006, so going on my 13th year dog training, and uh, started off at dog daycare just watching them, observing them, of course, working with them too. Um, and from there, I started working with uh, uh, a positive only trainer. So you'll, I'm sure you, if you're any, if you're familiar with <clears throat> the different schools of thought when it comes to dog training, there are those who think that um, dog training should be positive only or um, treat based or they call it science based. I started off with a trainer doing that style of training and then I got into a sport called Schutzen and for my German Shepherd owners and Belgian Malinois owners and just working dog owners, if you don't know about what that is, you should Google it. Um, Schutzen, it's German for protection dog. So I got into that and that was the complete opposite of at the time of positive only so it was compulsion based um, definitely used uh, adversive tools and so I kind of got both sides of the spectrum to arrive to a place now where man this is the old Milwaukee coat huh yeah it is um, anyway so now I'm at a place where I kind of use both because I see the benefits of uh, using treats and I have and I see the benefits of using um, adversive tools. Okay, so that's a little bit about me. Um, yeah, my passion's always been with psychology, not necessarily animals, but I am I gravitate towards dogs because well they're genuine and. Uh, yeah, I just love having fun with them. All right, so let's get to some questions. Hi, Marissa, how are you? I hope I pronounced your name right. Okay, here we go. Just checking on Winston's progress and what tools I will need to keep his progress going forward when he gets home. Great question. Winston is progressing very well. All of the, all of the dogs actually are progressing really well. Um, what tools you will need. I'm still working on that. Um, I'm going to need a little bit more time to determine that. But, um, because I have to figure out how, you know, given how stubborn he may be, um, given how long it may take to get him to a certain level where, where I see is beneficial to your situation. So I'll just need some more time. It's too early to really give a complete update and, and a game plan because I'm still getting to know all of the dogs, but we will get there. So, here we go. Thanks for your question. All right, next question. Hey, Jeremy, I hope you and the family are keeping warm. Um, I have a question. I have questions. I have a 105 pound chocolate lab foster dog who is blind he's older 
and slow, but I still think he can learn some things. I want to train him to be able to go down our porch steps, 10 steps or so, and into our backyard. I realize that he will need guidance now and maybe always to go down, but do you have any advice for training a blind dog? I know trust is the first step and we'll have to establish that. First thing I would do is put a leash on the dog and for the next 10 times you let the dog out, I will I would walk the dog on leash down the stairs. But while you're doing so, I would use your vo use your voice the entire time. Okay? And then I would as time goes on, I would loose loosen the leash, right? So he could have a little bit more independence and more independent and more independence of needing your guidance, but still having your voice there. And eventually you want to um, be uh, get to the bottom of the stairs before he gets there and then use holding the leash and just use nothing but your voice and not the leash so that he can hear what he's heard and know what to do um, exactly when you decide you want to put him down the stairs. And um, eventually his muscle memory may kick in. Um, and he'll go down the stairs by himself eventually. It may take some time, but um, that's what I would do. I've done that with uh, blind dogs before. I've actually had a blind dog know how to jump into a car, into a crate, um, just simply because the picture, well not the picture, but the, the sound of what we, you know, built was the same and he knew exactly what to do based on his other senses that he used, smell and hearing. So he'd hear the door latch open, he would smell the car, and he would know he's gotta get ready to jump on in. So that's what I would do. Uh, try that out, see if it helps. If it doesn't, let me know. Thanks for your question. Okay, my foster dog, has possession aggression, anything he deems is, at that moment, toys, food, and affection. He hasn't attacked either of my dogs yet, but he growls, and now my own two dogs are beginning to growl or snar snarl back at him to show him that they are not to be messed with. What's the best way to correct his behavior? He never lived with other dogs or been a part of a pack, so I'm thinking he doesn't understand the dynamic of sharing. Um, yeah. You're right, you're right. He may not understand the dynamic of sharing. And being that he's old and grumpy, he just doesn't feel like parting with it. But I would say this, um, I, I wouldn't let him have anything um, until he's, you know, humbles up in that situation. I mean, I, I, I really think that that's more of a behavior where he feels that he can do it and get away with it. And you don't want to not be there for your dogs because something may happen. A fight may break out. Um, so I would, I would squash that um, immediately, or try to at least. Put the e-collar on the dog and put, press the vibrate button. See, what, see if he likes that. See if that helps. Um, he's just gotta know that the growling is not acceptable. And depending on what it is, too, I always give dogs the benefit of the doubt. I don't think, uh, um, Mr. Rodriguez, what up, man? Um, I don't think some dogs or all dogs should just be comfortable with uh, high-valued resources like a bone or, um, you know, I don't know, even a favorite chew toy. I think dogs should be able to enjoy those things without the threat of another dog. Um, <clears throat> taking it. Because at the end of the day, if they were all wild, they'll, they'd will they all be resource aggressive. I mean, let's just be honest. Uh, so it's something that's natural in them. And we have to recognize that, that it's not as easy for every dog to do. Um, and I got some video on, on that. Uh, in that regard, so you'll get video. Um, we'll 
was it? Uh, you'll get some video. You'll get some video, and we'll explain everything. Everything's gonna be good. What's up, my son? <clears throat> uh, okay. All right. Next question. When a 70 pound hound keeps full on running and jumping at you, just knock her down. What do you think about her? Um, when a 70 pound hound keeps full on running and jumping at you, just knock her down. Uh, no. Um, what I would say is you do, you may have to. Especially if it's a hound, you may have to add an aversive tool to get the dog to jump. Now listen. If your dog is jumping on you, <clears throat> and okay, so if you have an aggressive dog, let's just let's just take it take it to basics right quick. If you have an aggressive dog, dog aggressive. Or human aggressive. Check these two things off. If you check these two things off, you might not get aggression. One of them is, is the dog allowed to jump on you? If a dog al is allowed to jump on you, which again causes, it may not cause you harm. It may not cause anybody harm. But fundamentally, for the dog to think it's okay to jump on you, in the dog world, it's a, it's it's pretty disrespectful. Pretty disrespectful that a dog is putting his two paws on you at it, when it wants, how it wants. That's a pretty disrespectful behavior. So if you've got any issues with your dog, and jumping is one of them. Stop the jumping. Get mutual mutual respect from your dog. That the dog thinks it's okay. Or that the dog will not think it's okay to jump on you. Very easy behavior to allow to happen. But fundamentally very important if you have a challenging dog that the dog stops jumping on you and guests okay that's num that's number one number two is get the dog to stop barking when you're home out the window at people dogs or anything like that is your dog allowed to bark when it wants and for how long it wants you want to stop that. Because if you can stop that, you will not, you have a much better chance at eliminating any sort of um, aggression. And, and you have a much better chance of guiding the dog through um, any sort of fear that the dog has. Because if you can stop jumping and barking, the dog then establishes a certain level of respect for you. If, because again, those are two real easy behaviors to allow to happen. Harder to stop, but important to be able to control. Okay, I'm not saying that your dog shouldn't bark ever. And I'm not saying that you should stop your dog from jumping on you because some trainers actually and people have it have um jumping that can be on command whatever um but um and they need it for working dogs blah 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 uh but again if you're struggling in any way when it comes to aggression or fear <clears throat> with strangers with other dogs mark those two things off your list work to get those two things off your list. No jumping and no barking. 
or you, at the least you should be able to stop the barking when you take when you tell them to be quiet. You can do those two things, and you'll see much improvement with your dog in all areas. Okay. Thank you for your question. Okay, let's see. Um, I have two dogs. Michelle, this question is for, for Michelle. I have two dogs who have gotten into a few fights recently. Two-year-old male Labradoodle and six-month-old English Springer Spaniel. Fights start out over a toy slash ball and escalates. They are 35 pounds and 25 pounds, so not terrible to break it up. But how should I handle it? I send them both to their place after I break it up and they settle. But it's annoying worrying about it. Um, all other times, the dogs are best buds, run and play, and even sleep together. But when, they're when they guard their resources, all bets are off. Um, so what you have to do is, there's a couple of things. What you have to do is identify the butthole, the one who wants to claim everything for, th for themselves, and you, and you give that dog a consequence strong enough to get the dog to rethink their actions. And, then, and that's how you're going to get them to be able to share and have a mutual understanding. But as the six-month-old female gets older, there are going to be areas in which um, the female may want to challenge the male, depending on if you have a dominant female or not. And so um, it's just like children fighting. The parents should not allow that to happen. But there are going to be scuffles, inevitably. Hopefully they figure it out and can have that mutual, mutual respect without too much uh, of your intervening uh, because that's how you can guarantee that they'll just get along but um, if that was my my pack I would definitely identify who 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 was m being more of the selfish one and you may even allow them to um, uh, you, you, you may want to take the ball and toy away for a while and then allow them to, uh, you know, become more comfortable with each other. What you don't want is for fights to keep happening and then they completely lose trust because then fights will keep happening and um, they'll be out of nowhere and you'll have to go back from square one to square one. Um, so take the toys away for a while. Let their... Let them figure out who's, who's who in other ways, in safer ways, like when they're playing and stuff, and and then and then take it from there. Give it another shot with with, you know, next week. You know what I'm saying? So that's what I would do. Thanks for your question. Feel free to ask another one. All right, Bali says the foster was surrendered by his previous family for his aggression behavior towards the younger child. Uh, then they were playing or running or making any sort of noise. He will stop when told, but he then later continued the behavior shortly. That means your consequence isn't strong enough. Also, his dynamic with Sapper is worse than Mal... Mal... Macklin? Macklin. He seems to like Macklin and doesn't challenge him, really. But he does challenge Sapper. That's because Sapper is the dominant... And, and I'm consider, considering keeping this dog, but I'm concerned he may not be a good fit for my household if he continues his controlling, aggressive behavior. They are uh, the same size, so I do worry that my dogs will have had enough of his behavior and will fight both. I mean, take that into account. You don't want to force anything. If your dogs aren't naturally a good fit, and it's going to take too much of your time, effort, and stress to... To, uh, to 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 monitor these do the dogs, he may be better off uh, in another home. Uh, all right, so don't beat yourself up if you can't get to that point.
but there's going to be tons of people who are going to like that old dog. I mean, this, you know, that that dog could 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 easily go to a, uh, a, a, a you know, a, a good home, live out the rest of his days, and be the only dog with no children. You know, um, so that's what I would do. I wouldn't stress on fixing the the, the problem so much. The guy is an older guy. You know, I, I have some empathy for that. So, um, I'll let you decide what you want to do and keep me in the loop. All right? Thanks for your question. Have you used any meds for incontinence, prescription, prescription or natural? Dog spayed early. Um, I haven't used any meds, but I'm not against meds. I'll, I want to make that clear. I'm not against meds. Because I do know it helps if facilitated with a game plan of weaning off those meds. Veterinarians, they often prescribe meds with not a, not a, not a game plan or not a good game plan. Medication is parallel with behavior and it should be treated as such. There should be a behaviorist working with the effects of the medication. You don't want to continue to always have those meds because they're just a bridge just like any other training tool like we use. Any training tool that we use should be temporary. Shouldn't be a for everything to get to a goal. Same thing with medication. Okay, so um, I'm not against meds. I don't. I haven't used them yet or enough to say yes or no. But I'm not against them. Okay. Thanks for your question. I don't allow toys or bones when I'm away. I try to keep that only for when we're home. I call him. The party police. Yes. He tries to break up any fun they're having. He, he follows Sapper when he goes to, in the room with toys. I just want to be sure he's understanding that's not okay. Yeah, I mean, that's 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 a good goal. Keeping him from, you know, understanding that it's that those that behavior is not okay. You're right, and he's being very controlling. Um He's being very controlling, and um, you know that's it's kind of an asshole move, to be honest. If he's following your dog around, you know, if you don't intervene the way you need to, it will result in a fight because tension will build up. You know, Sapper's gonna remember the thing, remember every time the dog follows him around. Like that's that's kind of annoying, you know. And so your dog may uh, start building up, you know you start taking, you know, score of how many times that older dog is being a butthole and one day it'll come out, you know, sort of like how we sometimes argue with, uh, with our partners. So, so yeah, nip that in the bud. Be, be, uh, be as gentle as possible with the old guy, but, but be as firm as necessary. All right. Thanks for your question. I'm reading these backwards. How do you stop him from barking at and jumping on me? Uh, so, the easy way to stop a dog from jumping on you is to um, claim their space. So when they're jumping on you, they're trying to claim your space. What I tell people is to defend yourself by lifting up a knee and then timing it where your where the dog's chest is going to hit your knee. Now, I'm not telling you to knee your dog. I'm telling you to defend yourself. Because the because for some people, some dogs are so big enough, well they need they need to defend themselves. Uh, because some dogs will really hurt people when they jump. Okay. Um, so lift your knee up. You're not going into the dog and kneeing the dog, but you're you're sort of, again, giving something that's going to move forward, claiming space. Forward pressure is what the dog needs. 
forward pressure from you somehow. And no is not enough because he doesn't take your word for it. So you must add something else. Okay? So lift your knee. Let the dog hit your knee and say no. Then say no. Okay? Um, that's how you get your dogs to stop jumping on you. Again. And then, so the other thing is, um, never, ever, ever pay attention or pet the dog right after he jumps on you. Even if you, even if you uh, have de properly defended yourself and you've said no, you don't want to pet the dog. Um, you want to let the dog know that that was wrong. Okay. So um, the other thing I think is the biggest key when it comes to jumping is when you come home from work and he's all excited and you you know give the dog what it wants the excitement is going to uh, allow that jumping behavior to continue it's going to think it's going to make it okay for the dog to jump on you so when you come home from work don't uh, don't really uh, you know, pet your dog. Don't make your dog the priority. Don't give the dog what it wants. Whatever it may be. All right. Thanks for your question. And then the barking is going to have to stop by um, teaching the dog the place command, which I'll do. So don't you worry. Okay. Say hi to Cooper. But I do have a question for our 10-month-old Yorkie. That at times can be food aggressive. How can I stop it before it gets out of hand? He's fine with adults, but not with not other animals. Our three and a half old, um, but not other animals. Our three and a half old granddaughter. Um, well, you're going to have to catch the dog doing it. And you're going to have to give the dog a consequence when it decides to uh, get resource aggressive. Okay, and so you can... When I send Cooper home with the doggy don't, I would start with that. Okay? And for those of you who don't know what a doggy don't is, it's just a tool, a sound device that makes, that sounds like a taser. It's not a taser, it just sounds like one. Okay? Press the button, it goes eh, like that. So that may work. Thanks for your question. Okay, Janelle says, when dealing with a dog, when dealing with a breeder dog that is used to its life outside and alone, how do you introduce the dog into life as a family dog inside? Of course, this takes time and patience, but I want to ensure we're helping her in the right way. She's terrified of everything. Well, um... You want to introduce the dog to any new situation with structure. Okay, um, and so what I would do is maybe crate train the dog inside and then maybe keep the door open so the dog can come in and out when it wants. And don't do a lot of coaxing. Do some coaxing, but then um, give the dog some time for the dog to come out the crate or come to you guys on its own. There's always a balance of, you know, um, helping the dog by giving it treats and petting, but at the same time, um, you want to give the dog some breathing room too. Don't overwhelm the dog. And um, the combination of those two are, is probably the, the fastest way to get the dog to realize. The other thing is, you know, let the dog drag a leash around so you can um, not freak out the dog when you go and grab for the dog. Um, and you can easily just grab the leash and show, show you know, the outside, show it where it's, you know, Show her the rules, pretty much. So, that's about it. All right. Thanks for your question. Chris says, where are you located? Let's honor all mothers today. Press and like if you love your mom. Why? Why today? But I would like it anyway. I'm located in Green Bay, Wisconsin. where I'm at and it's the temperature is well we have wind chills of 100 and no it's negative 13 right now wind chills of negative 50 the dogs did not want to go outside 
Okay. Finally says, so at six years old, and having controlling aggression towards children and other dogs, do you feel it would be best he lived out his days in a secluded home? I was struggling with the decision because I'd like to break the behavior and give him a sense of stability, but uh, I'm unsure what's best for him. What's best for him is to see if you can help him with those challenges. Given that you are an experienced person with dogs, um, see if you can help him in that way. You know? And if it becomes too much of a problem, then you may want to reconsider. But, um, but one thing's for sure, if he goes to another home, uh, chances are that they will have young children over pretty good. Chances, you know, so I think I'm, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a dog trainer, so I think we should try and help them be the best they can be no matter what the situation, as opposed to making it, because no matter where that dog goes, those problems are going to follow the dog. And, um, you know, I'd hate for a child to get hurt. So, we should try and work the dog through it. Maybe, uh, maybe we should set up a private lesson and I can give you a little bit more of a game plan and, or see if it's actually possible. So, that's what I would do. All right. Thanks for your question. Okay, next question. Okay, how do you handle a dog that barks just to bark? As soon as we step outside to go walk. He's not barking at someone or another dog. Just barks to let the neighborhood know he's present. He's so tiny. He's tiny. So maybe small dog syndrome? I correct with hush and heel, but he starts right back up. Um, okay, so um, I don't think dogs bark for no for no reason and I don't think he barks for to know that or to let the neighborhood know that he's present the dog is barking because he feels some way insecure about the outside when he enters the outside world or out of your house the dog is barking because it's insecure um, and so the best way to help the dog feel more secure is going to be through your leadership by a way of structure and time. And so um, what you have to do is get the, give the dog some more structure on the walk or in the areas where there is uncertainty. Uh, make a checklist of how much, so this is the key. Anywhere where your dog displays behavior that is um, out of what seems to be out of their control, obviously out of your control, but something that they can't help but to do, obsessive, needs to be stopped now. Which means if every time the mailman comes to your door or mailbox and your dog barks, every single time while you're home that should be stopped if your dog pulls on leash every single time all the time that should be stopped if your dog chews on its foot every single time all the time it should be stopped if your dog looks at a light reflection and nothing else matters, that behavior should stop. If you are playing laser point fetch thingy with your dog, you should be shut. I mean, you should stop immediately. I still, there's a lot of people out there that think that that's cute and it could lead to very bad behavior. So, Anything that's out of their control, you should help. Um, you should intervene and help them see that uh, it's not um, something that they have to do. 
Because there's not one behavior that should be so there every time, all the time, if you're not asking for it. Okay? So help your dog out. You're actually going to help them out if you can stop your dog obsessively barking out the window at people, whining uh, when it gets in the car, um, anything. It doesn't matter what it is. Nothing should be obsessive. Everything should be able to be controlled. Or just displayed in moderation. Alright? Thank you for your question. Okay, let's see if I got any more. Oh, yeah, got some more. Okie dokie. How do I get my uh, year old shepherd to sit still to allow me to wipe his paws? Um, so I would take the dog's escape route away. When you're grooming your dog's nails or paws or brushing the dog or checking the ears or even just petting the dog, you want to be able to have the ability to say stay and your dog stop trying to escape your whatever you're doing. Okay, so if you're wiping his paws, um, you have to you have to take away his ability to, to manipulate the situation in his favor. When he tries to run away from you, when he spins away from you, when he runs away from you, when he bites you, all those things are there to um, manipulate the situation in his favor. I don't want this, and I'm going to do these things to not have this happen. And so you really have to have a certain level of respect from your dog that, um, that your dog then says, okay, fine, I got to stay here. Because you're not hurting the dog. You're grooming the dog, and you should be able to groom the dog um, without the dog having a fit or throwing or walking away or, or something like that. If you can't do those things, then you've got work to do when it comes to how much respect the dog should have for you. Okay, um, this is, That is the most important thing. Respect is the most important thing. Everything else comes after that. Okay. So, um, you can start by tying the dog up and letting the dog know that, first of all, what I'm doing is not, is, is not going to hurt you. And secondly, and as a result of that, there's no need to move away, run away, or this, that, and the other. Okay? Thank you for your question. I'll message you for a private lesson with him. I'd like to get a better perspective on what I'm dealing with. You betcha. You betcha, you betcha, you betcha. Okie dokie, next question. Um, where are we at? Okay. Uh, I put his food dish down and he will sit and wait until I put reins down in the crate and lock her up. And I will go walk out of the room and he still growls. Should I just keep walking and ignore it? Um, no, I wouldn't tolerate growling, but growling is contextual. Um, you, 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 to, in order to really give you a, a good answer, I'd have to, it'd have to, I'd have to know or see why the dog is growling. Because growling doesn't mean one thing. Growling can mean, can come from a bratty perspective, but growling can also become, can, can come from a fear perspective. And then also a growling can come from a happy dog as well. So it is contextual. When you're talking about putting food down, if you've had the dog for years, then it could speak more towards brattiness because the dog at that point doesn't fear you. Um, but say I am I got a dog, you know, and, and the dog is growling, but sitting and waiting and growling. I'm okay with that not going to correct the dog for growling. I'm going to see if it goes away with time as we get to know each other. I'm not going to correct the growling when the, when, when the food bowl is down, but the dog is waiting. If the dog decides to go after the food before I tell the dog to, then I'm going to correct the dog. But if the dog is growling 
and uh, still sitting and not going after the food, I'm not going to necessarily correct that. So um, say all that to say growling can mean a few different things. It's contextual. You want to make sure you're evaluating why they're growling. You don't want to correct a fearful growling dog. It's not right. All right. Thanks for your question. All right, folks, those of you who are just tuned in, uh, this is a dog behavior Q&A. Please feel free to ask any and all questions that you have. It may help someone else that comes along, not today, not tomorrow, but a week from now. So um, please ask questions no matter how ridiculous it may seem because there's someone out there that is struggling uh, with the same thing. All right. Okay, here we go. Um, I have a board and train who is an incessant whiner in the car. Whining has stopped in all other areas except the car. What would you suggest? He doesn't whine while crated in the car, but his owner car doesn't have space for a crate. I just give the dog a, uh, something to do. I just tell the dog to down. I don't care if the dog whines as long as it's listening. I think, in my opinion, if the dog is listening, the whining will melt away. So as long as the dog can down, whine away. Because the dog is choosing to listen to you still, which is half the battle. All right. For your question. Okay, any ideas to slow down an extremely fast eater besides slow feed bowls? Yeah, a couple people do. What what a couple people do is um feed them in the grass. Although you ain't doing that, Wisconsin. Not today. Not tomorrow either. Um, cookie sheet. Uh, crate, tray, anything flat. Um, all those things work. Snuffle mat, Ryan says. Um, all those things work. All right. Thanks for your question. We will be working on potty training as well. Of course. Although the weather is working against me right now. The dog, dogs do not want to be outside. So, but we will be working on that. All right. Okay. My 10 month old puppy seems to have an inversion to kids. Sometimes. He began barking like crazy. Every time a kid walked by. Even if they weren't doing anything to provoke them. Yet other times. He seems perfectly fine with kids. I've heard that dogs go through fear periods, but I don't know if this is something that we need to address right away or just monitor and continue to expose him to kids carefully. You, uh... You want to be aggressive when it comes to fixing, helping your dog realize that kids are okay. I'd be willing to bet the dog is necessarily fearful, but just doesn't have a um, a certain level of acceptance when it comes to children, and that's only going to be well. The fast, the the best way to help that is through your leadership. Sure, maybe time would do it. But it's a maybe. Like if you just monitor it and continue to expose them, that's a that's a that's a maybe uh, route. But if you are, you know, correcting that barking behavior, he's barking like crazy. Stop that. If you stop that barking, you'll be well on your way to getting the dog to accept the things that you want the dog to accept. 
And then don't let your children be too obnoxious. We do have to sometimes give our dogs the benefit of the doubt. Some children are absolutely out of control. <laughs> and some kids deserve to be bit. But that still falls on you, on the parents. So the dog, dogs will be much more likely to respect or uh, get along with our children if we can show that we can control our children and we can control the dog. It's the best, the mo that's the optimum way to get them to develop a good relationship. All right. Do I have merch? Great question. I'm working on it. So it's coming. Great question. I'm working on it. I'll be in Madison March 2nd. And hopefully I'm going to bring some with. Okay. What do you do for dogs that bust out of kennel? Due to anxiety, breaking bars, pooping all over. Uh, if a four eight hundred crate is not an option, um, let's see. Bust out of kennels due to anxiety, breaking bars, pooping all over. Um, well, I would obviously question first and foremost. If the dog is getting adequate exercise. Okay. And then secondly, I would um, start with how much time you're spending around the dog in the crate. So you have that chance to um, correct the first signs of anxiety. You know, because a lot of people think a lot of people think separation anxiety is uh, only happens or only can be fixed. No, only happens when they're not home. And a lot of people think that they can't fix it because of that. And it's like, no, nope, there's tons of things a dog can display that you can um, guide them, that they'll, that they're, that will this, that they will display while you're home, and inside the crate or outside the crate. So there's, it depends. It's a, that's a very, like broad, question. Depends on how long you've had the dog. Depends on the type of dog. Depends on how, how old the dog is. And um, depends on if the dog really just has crate issue, or a, I mean a separation anxiety issue, or a claustrophobic. Uh, 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 if the dog just doesn't like to be in a box. And one way you can um, you can you can figure that out is how's his, how's the dog's behavior when. You, the dog is in the yard and you're on the opposite side of the fence. Is the dog trying to get at you? Or is the dog independent of your uh, uh, attention? Because that would be separation anxiety that you can figure out without the crate. So you want to nail down what the problem is first. And I couldn't be able to tell you exactly that. So I won't be able to give you that approach until I know that stuff. Okay. Separation anxiety. Any ideas on making it better? Sure. We're already talking about that. Um, I hope you just heard my explanation. Um, okay. First thing you want to do with separation anxiety. Um, is evaluate how you are dispersing attention or how you are um, dispersing 
what the dog wants and how the dog acts to get it. Because dogs are going to act a certain way to get what they want. And then knowing that, we have to start figuring out how to get different behavior um, to help them get what they want. So, in my opinion, the best way to help with separation anxiety is to get the dog to realize that you won't get anything you want unless you are a cool, calm, collected customer. Actually, you might get something you might not like um, because ignoring for some dogs, uh, you'll be there until the cows go home, until the snow melts, you'll be there. Be there forever. And so, um, when, they, when they get anxious that you've left the room, you also want to make sure you're giving them a certain dose of autonomy, uh, which means do not let the dog follow you around all the time in the house. That's them. You're feeding in then to their separation anxiety. Get the dog to leave you the hell alone. Don't let the dog in the kitchen. That's an easy rule. No kitchen. Tell the dog to stay out of the kitchen. So that's an easy little boundary that will help separation anxiety. You want to, again, develop an independent dog that doesn't have to have you there. The dog should be comfortable by itself. Away from your attention. So evaluate how your dog gets attention. Is your dog, and do you give in to every attempt that your dog um, does to get attention? Do you give in? Do you pet the dog every time it wants to be pet? You're feeding into separation anxiety. Okay, and then there's a whole other thing about the crate protocol as well. Um, crate training just isn't just potty training. It's also training to, to, uh, to get the dog to realize that calm behavior gets the dog out the crate, gets the dog fed, and gets the dog your attention. So those are the things I'd evaluate. Uh, I could go into it and talk to, for hours about it. But those are just the gists of it, okay? You, you, uh, you don't want your dog to follow you around the house. You don't want to give in to every attempt to, uh, for your dog to, give, to get affection from you. You want to do it on your terms. And those two things will help. All right, thanks for your question. Big rocks and bowls to slow feeding. That's another one, hey? All right, this is an amazing training tool for owners and your pet. What is? One other thing I wanted to mention. My foster is great at daycare and also a very gentle dog. He takes things gingerly and is slow moving. I find it odd that he can do so well in a large daycare environment, but yet struggles to get along with my home and has a problem with running and playing. Is it because he can't control the large group? Uh, it, could, it just simply could be because it's the territorial thing, and it maybe it's a smaller confined thing. When dogs are away from the territory, they some tend to act different. Okay, so I got a lot of people who say, well, if my dog goes to your boarding train and he doesn't act aggressive, how are you going to fix it? Um, so, a lot of dogs get along just fine at dog daycare, but at home or on leash, they're freaking monsters. So, it's fine. It's normal. All right, Paul says, Rue is so much better in the house, is much better in the house when she hears the neighbors. No more pacing and stays down in her bed, but, but at times will whine. How should we correct that? Give a vibrate button and then say down. Or say down and see what that gets you just outright. 
Um, even if her head's, even if she's in a down, stay down so she can put that chin on that bed. And then just stay tough on her in that regard, and it will, and it will fix itself. Um, but then you can use the vibrate button or the appropriate uh, e-collar uh, the electronic uh, level. Okay. The dog stays in the down, isn't barking. Owners need to work full time. Yeah. My dog is a rescue. I got him at approximately one year of age. The shelter had told me he had a friend that he played with while he was there. She was bigger than him and very active. I've had him for four years now and haven't had any, haven't had good luck with socializing him. He seems to be okay with dogs that are smaller than him. Not that interested in playing, but not aggressive. But dogs that are near the same size or bigger than him, he looks really uncomfortable and tense and will snap at them if they're close. Do I just keep him from all the dogs that are bigger than him? Is there anything I could do to make him more comfortable around similar sized dogs than just that just want to play? Yes. What you can do is correct his behavior anytime he gets nervous. If there's no re reason for the dog to be nervous, then you got to show the dog that it's, there's no reason for, the, for him to be nervous. And if he acts aggressive, he should get a consequence to help rethink his actions and to help humble him because he just could be threatened by the size of the dog. If he's okay with smaller dogs, then he's not as threatened because they're smaller. And size does matter when it comes to dogs. And so... Um, what you have to do is have to have some sort of way to get the dog to really pay attention to you at a moment's notice. He should re be able to respond to your vocal um, cues. Hey, stop, no, something like that. When you ask him of that, and that's going to help him say, oh, no, or, I, I, I need to knock it off, or this tension needs to stop. And if you can't, then I would use some sort of tool, doggy don't, e collar, keep the dog on leash, something like that. But you have to get the dog to realize, and you have to watch the dog enough um, to actually get that correction. So the next time you're around big dogs, keep the dog on leash, but maybe drop a leash, or keep a squirt bottle, or a doggy don't, or something like that, so that the moment he gets stiff, then you can tell him no, and use your adversive tool to get the dog to realize that um, that behavior is not okay and it's not okay to get aggressive. And then you'll start to see him open up, become vulnerable, and have good relationships with bigger dogs. All right? Thanks for your question. Feel free to ask another one. Hey, Ryan. You're going to Indian Creek Trail. I don't think so. What's that Indian Creek Trail? It's okay, Stephanie. It's all good. Feel free to ask another question. What age do you generally recommend waiting until for e-collar training? E-collar training should wait until the dog really is good at what you want the dog to know. Okay, e-collar training should only be... Oh, shit's is wrong. No, I'm not. I would love to. But, uh, unfortunately... Between my young son and my business, I have little time for a lot of things. Um, but anyway, yeah, e-collar training um, should should and it base and it varies on the dog and the dog's intelligence. But uh, you want to wait until the dog knows exactly what you want before you add the e-collar. The e-collar is not should not be for teaching. It should be for proofing what the dog already knows. So once the dog has a really good understanding of what you want, basic obedience, down, stay, come, on your bed. If the dog knows those things really well, then you can add an e-collar. But get a good e-collar. Get an e-collar that can be very versatile, can be very sensitive to the sensitive dogs, and can be very not sensitive to the stubborn dogs. Those are the kind of e-collars you want to work with. Because you can, um, it won't be something that can cause trauma. All right, along the same line, we have issues with our lab golden mix. She's two and a half. 
while camping, she gets aggressive and has a bit of, uh, and has bit friends when on leash. When it gets dark, we just use her shocker beeper collar uh, off the leash, and she's good, and she's a good girl. But in general, campgrounds have leash rules, and we do use the pinch collar when walking. So what I would say is don't let people touch her, okay? Um, you want to have, that's the one side of it is you want to kind of um, give, let her have the opportunity to learn or relearn that people are okay when she's on leash because on leash dynamic can be different than off leash dynamic. If the dog has the ability to go away, it's much more likely to, much less likely to involve themselves in, a, in conflict like biting. And, um, and so when they're on leash, it is really then up to you to change her perspective on people. If your dog doesn't go up to them, wagging tail and wanting to be pet, don't let anyone pet the dog. If the dog is off leash, the dog can do it on its own. The dog can say, I don't want to be pet by you and walk away. Especially when it's not on its territory. Okay. Um, I appreciate that, Ryan. Um, yes, the dog trip does have great levels as well. Dog trip is a great, uh, some doctors have like 180 levels. 180. Um, so yeah, that's a good option. Thanks for mentioning that. But yeah, um, first of all, again, on one hand, any bad behavior you want to uh, make sure your dog knows that that's not okay. But on the other hand, if your dog does have a little bit of fear on leash, then give your dog the option to